Welcome back to East 315. This is lecture 7, part 2 of our talk on baseline studies. So today I'll talk about some of the challenges associated with environmental baseline studies, mainly referring to field work, some of the things that we'll run into in the field that make it very challenging to gather the data we need to characterize the existing environment. I'll finish this lecture with a case study on the Peace Athabasca Delta. And as you'll see, it's highly relevant both to baseline studies and to our case study on the Peace River, because as I'll get into, the Peace Athabasca Delta has undergone changes in the last five decades. Meanwhile, there have been hydroelectric reservoir development and oil sands development, as well as many other types of human disturbances upstream of the Delta. So it makes it very challenging to try and go back in time and try and understand what is the natural baseline and what are the causes of any changes that have been seen since then. So with that, I'll turn it over to the lecture and I hope you enjoy it. So I kind of walked through the major components of baselines on Tuesday and kind of talked about component by component how it's done. And now I'm gonna talk about challenges with baseline work. This mainly relates to field work, but not entirely. Um, and this is really general to, most of it's pretty general to any component. Um, so I'll talk about uh, the things on this list in order, and in the end, after I talk about legacy projects, I'll talk about the Peace Athabasca Delta as a case study of a major legacy project, actually an accumulation of many projects that now proponents are dealing with uh, the legacy issues of never having done proper baselines uh, 50 or 60 years ago. So ephemeral phenomena, aside from the nice alliteration, all this means is Something that only occurs periodically. It doesn't necessarily mean something that changes with time. It's something that is either there or not there. So an ephemeral stream is a stream that flows only during freshet. Uh, there are all sorts of ephem ephemeral phenomena. So fish spawning is a really good one. If you're doing an assessment of fish, you really need to know when they're spawning. In addition to a, a number of other sort of biological processes, the rut, you know, they only happen once a year. Um, they're fairly predictable. Uh, but not entirely predictable. So you can kind of guess, or based on previous years, you can make an educated guess as to when these uh, events will occur. Uh, but the challenge then is actually being in the field and being able to measure them as they occur. And so uh, really the only way to go about that is if, you need, if it's something that needs a person in the field is that they need to be there at the earliest possible day that something can occur and stay there until it's finished. And so I'm going to use spring pulse as an example of that, because spring pulse is a really, really challenging phenomenon to uh, measure. So spring pulse is essentially a um, uh, result of aerial deposition landing on snow. And the aerial deposition can be any compound that was emitted up into the air or global constituents that are just circulating in the air. Uh, but it usually applies to acid precursors, which are NOx and SOx, which turn into acid rain. But they also come down as acid in the snow, and so they're non-reactive. They're essentially uh, nitrate, uh, nitric acid and sulfuric acid, which is relatively inert because it's frozen, and it's just sitting there accumulating over winter. Any deposition that's occurred accumulates for about three to five months, depending on where you are. Same thing happens with uh, smoke, soot, um, any kind of uh, PAHs that are emitted up into the air that come down with snow, uh, metals, really anything, almost everything that goes up comes back down through uh, wet or dry deposition over the winter. And so now we have this watershed which has some load of uh, contaminant in it and it's just sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. Uh, temperature rises which you can actually see on the graph here. This is from a really detailed study that was done, when was it, 1989? And you can see that they sample every day, waiting for uh, the flow to rise. And along with the flow, they're measuring the acid input. And you can see that pretty much on the day that the flow goes up, or maybe the next day there's a bit of a lag, uh, but pretty much immediately you see this large pulse of acidity coming into in this case, it's the Firebag River. And as you can also see, it doesn't really take much of a temperature change. So right here, the temperature is barely above zero. The sunlight can melt the snow even if the temperature is actually below zero. So 
it's really hard to know in advance when the temperature is going to be warm enough, when the sunlight will actually melt it, even if it's not warm enough. And so that's a big challenge. So I mentioned here summer gradients. So the question here is, um, if you don't have the resources to send somebody out and sample, and somebody goes out on April 23rd, they sample here, somebody comes back four days later, they sample here, and really their data set is gonna look like this, and they think, oh, well, we captured it because we got you know, the elevated concentrations. And in fact, it's entirely possible that if they measured four times a day on this graph, this, this, the peak would be higher. And so this really applies to anything that happens just over a short period. It's a big challenge for monitoring. I'm going to cover some of the solutions to that on this slide because this, the, some of the issues are the same. So with any sort of field work, often uh, the scientist or tech or whoever it is is out in the field somewhere far away from civilization and they're in challenging conditions of many types. Another very challenging condition is thin ice. Normally you just you can't go on it, you can't sample during thin ice. Uh, that's um, actually being solved these days with drone sampling. Uh, drone sampling is uh, becoming a lot more common for any sort of unsafe sampling. Um, and frankly, I'm shocked that these two were ever allowed out on that water. I, I don't know of any other company that would allow that. Um, this is a super dangerous condition. So there were, and I know these two have been out on this lake, but not in this kind of condition. Uh, so they're, they're wearing Mustang survival suits, which float, and they're really well insulated. But as this young lady's leaning over paddling, I mean, it's really uh, dangerous because she could pull herself in, and then the guy behind her is going to lean over and try and grab her, and then they're both in the water, and their radios are wet, and you know, it, it, I, I, I'm seriously shocked that they were ever allowed to do this. Um, but, but thin ice is a really good example of a period when often the uh, proponent or whoever is required to get the data will just say it was too unsafe, we didn't get the data, we're not going to get the data. Uh, human safety overrides anything else that we could ever worry about, and that's usually totally acceptable. Um, so rugged terrain, even if you're out flying in a helicopter, the helicopter needs a place to land, and up in the boreal forest, uh, landing spots are fairly, um, well, it depends, depends on which part of the forest, but there can be a lot of distance between where you need to sample and where, where a helicopter can land. In the old days, they used to actually sling people, meaning they would hang people from about a 50-foot cable beneath the helicopter and drop them off. Um, logging used to be done that way a lot, but that's clearly unsafe and I'm pretty sure that doesn't happen anywhere anymore. Well, maybe it does, but nowhere that I've ever heard of uh, would allow that either. So that's been banned for most industries. So the solutions are, if available, uh, data loggers are great. Um, I mentioned the challenges with data loggers, um, but having a data logger, you know, uh, covered in muskrat nest is not anywhere near as problematic as having a person fall through the ice. So installing multiple data loggers and letting the data loggers do the monitoring where humans don't want to and shouldn't go. Drone sampling, I should have put that on here. Um, there are lots of devices in, in chemistry, both in air chemistry and water chemistry, that are sort of integrators, so passive samplers. Uh, they've been used in air quality for many years. Essentially, it's a device that uh, will adsorb or ab absorb, depending on the device, uh, chemicals from the air, and then it's a matter of calibrating that to understand how, how it integrates. So it, it might absorb everything that comes its way. Some of them actually have fans to push air through. So there's lots of devices uh, that, are, that are suitable that you can put out in the field so that humans don't have to go. And the water membrane devices are actually very cleverly designed to mimic um, biological membranes. So you get not just an integration over time, but you get some measure of uh, bioavailability of what's being sampled. There's also remote sensing, if that uh, suits your component. And I put grad students, it's, it's not a joke. Um, a lot of times companies will um, 
say, we can't do this, uh, hire some grad students. And it's not that they want to put grad students in unsafe positions, it's just that grad students are usually a lot more willing to go out into the field, set up a tent, and stay there for a week or two to do the measurements, whereas most companies can't afford to do that. So I know I would have, but I, I did some of that uh, as a grad student, and it was kind of fun. Um, but I wasn't anywhere really dangerous. I was 10 miles south of Calgary, so. That brings us into health and safety. So health and safety practices vary a lot by company, and in most mainstream companies, whether it's industry or a consulting firm or whoever, uh, most are extremely rigorous these days in their health and safety practices, uh, but it does vary. So I know of some small companies that really don't have much uh, at all in the way of uh, policies and procedures and often what they'll do is they'll just accept the policies and procedures of whoever they're working for. Um, some of them provide basic information about health and safety when you go out in the field. Some will follow the letter of the law, so WorkSafe BC for example has a lot of requirements and a company will just say okay we'll do, we'll do WorkSafe because that's what we need to do and we don't want to go crazy with paperwork fine, it's legal. Um, some are really more cover your ass, which is a lot of paperwork and it's, uh, it's pretty bureaucratic. That can be kind of an annoying process to work within. Uh, but in any case, the more of this there is, the more training, documentation. I actually went over this slide last time, but I've kind of changed it, so I, I moved it uh, further down into here. Another very interesting part of baselines is called the shifting baseline syndrome. And so this is there's a case study given in the Noble textbook. In this case book, or sorry, in, the, in this case study, uh, they talk about the new normal. Um, so they, they look at some caribou habitat, and they're doing a baseline study of the habitat, and uh, they do an assessment, um, and they find that the activity will only reduce the habitat by 2%. And so the assessment says, oh, that's great, that's almost nothing, that's really negligible. But then when they look at it more closely, they say, okay, it's only 2%, but we've got highways, transmission corridors, cut blocks, and actually, because of fragmentation, um, our, uh, our habitat has already been reduced by 60%, and now 2% seems a little bit bigger. So um, I'm going to also draw a graph. Over time, if you have multiple projects, call that year one, and you're 50, and you've got some variable, it doesn't matter, water concentration, percent of habitat affected, it really doesn't matter. You know, it, it's gonna follow some fairly random or stochastic sort of pattern, maybe an annual summary, but, or an annual cycle, and then project one comes along, and it kind of bumps it up to here. And now, concentrations have risen, or have Area of disturbed has risen. Another project comes online. And this is in the past. And now uh, you're hired to go do a baseline study. And all of this stuff has been happening for 50 years. And you're told to go out into the woods and measure something. And this is what you're going to measure. And then when it gets assessed, you now have to decide, what, what is my actual baseline? My, my true baseline has shifted. This may or may not be available to measure, or it might not have been measured 50 years ago. Often it wasn't. This might have been, but you know, uh, maybe in the 1990s, in the early 2000s, uh, this project came along and they did a baseline and they said, okay, nobody ever measured this, but this is our baseline. And now you come up here and measure this. So. That's a real challenge. Um, there is no clear-cut way of hindcasting or trying to predict what happened in the past. It's really um, specific to each component, uh, but it's definitely something that you need to be aware of. And if you're doing an environmental impact assessment, often what will happen is rather than just call it a baseline, we'll say this is the existing case, and you don't call it a baseline, and this is pre-development, and you just abandon the baseline term altogether because none of this is really a baseline. I mean, this is the true baseline, but it's impossible to really know what it is. 
So if you come across this, I guess that's my advice, is just try not to use the word baseline for, for, an, for an environment where everything's already shifted, which is a lot of our, you know, that's a lot of our, our country has been affected in one way or another. Yeah, like I say, it doesn't, I, I don't know of any clear-cut way to do this. I've tried many different methods. None of them are satisfactory to myself or really anybody else, but you just do it the best you can and make sure that you're explicit about what you're calling these things. Pristine environments is an interesting <coughs> one. So really there is no such thing as a purely pristine environment. You can measure mercury at the top of glaciers in the high Arctic. You can measure all sorts of contaminants all over uh, the world. Um, there's all sorts of activities that go on that don't really get considered in a baseline or an EIA. So number one, if you're out doing a baseline somewhere, chances are great that somebody's been out there exploring. Some geologists have been digging some uh, whatever sort of scientists or engineers that need to make sure there's a viable project. They've been out there already disturbing the land just simply by being there and trying to measure it, measure its potential. So exploration can uh, kind of mess up your pristine environment. Forestry and agriculture, unless you're way up north, there's forestry and agriculture almost, forestry and or agriculture almost everywhere. Fire suppression, this one's always been interesting to me. Um, so this is a tanker uh, dropping flame retardant. Flame retardant is made of ammonium phosphate. And for anybody who remembers limnology, aquatic systems are very sensitive to phosphorus. And so if they drop a ton of uh, phosphorus, which I'm sure they're dropping several tons there. That will raise the water by a microgram per liter in a trillion liters. So fortunately, most of what they drop stays on the trees and on the land, but certainly not all of it. And often, uh, you know, there will be a fire very close to a river. If there's a river flowing through where this uh, tanker is dropping, it's going to go right on the river. They don't drop it on lakes, because fires don't happen on lakes, but anywhere there's a river, a small catchment in a forest that's leading fairly close to a lake, uh, a significant amount of that is going to end up in the lake. And I looked into that, I've never actually seen it uh, studied anywhere. Um, I might look again sometime, but it's a really interesting question to me. I have seen cases where um, people have seen uh, increases in productivity after forest fires, but it's never really been directly linked and probably because it's extremely challenging. Um, nobody in this zone is gonna be out there measuring water chemistry. I actually took that picture. Uh, that was right near my house. And I, I can promise you nobody was out there bothering to measure anything. You're just fighting fire. Uh, and everybody else is evacuated. So it's a really interesting thing to study. Another big topic, not so much in Canada, but worldwide, uh, is artisanal mining. So this is essentially some person on the side of a mountain digging, maybe doing a bit of blasting, but pretty much using hand tools and trying to extract some ore. Now, the reason I say, did I use the word horrific? Yeah, I did. It is truly horrific. They're using all sorts of chemicals. They can be using um, cyanide for, for gold. Um, all sorts of totally terrible chemicals and it's totally unregulated. And I have worked in Peru downstream of one of these, and they cause a giant plume of pollution downstream because it's just basically blast and grab what you can. And it's a really unfortunate situation. Um, the governments in, for sure in Peru and probably lots of other countries actually promote it because it's a, a source of income for people. And the government doesn't really have to do anything. They just allow it, and people will go out and do the mining. They don't have to do any kind of assessment. So this is a really, really bad problem. I would say it's somewhat problematic in Canada. Uh, there are some rules around artisanal mining. There are actually thousands and thousands of people, probably right now, all over BC, uh, doing very small-scale mining. And I only learned about this a couple years ago uh, when somebody wanted to help um, give input into the Water Sustainability Act when the Water Sustainability Act was changed. And so for, uh, I guess, all of time up until two years ago, they were totally unregulated. They could dig a hole next to a river, uh, dump uh, their waste anywhere. 
really it was it was surprisingly unregulated. Now, for the most part, the people I talked to were pretty aware of not disturbing rivers, not disturbing water bodies, but nevertheless, they're out there using a backhoe. It's kind of not as bad as if you've seen those shows about the uh, the miners in Alaska. It's not that bad, but it's not too far off. They're not well regulated. Probably they're just allowed to do what they do because it's such a small scale. Anyway, it's a bit of a problem and I'm surprised it's still allowed. Anyway, so I, I, I don't want to get off on a rant there, but the reason I'm talking about this is because if you're doing a baseline now, the problem for a baseline is it's not inventory. So you can have artisanal miners a mile upstream of you. You don't know they're there. Nobody knows they're there. Um, they do have to file some sort of a, a permit to be there, uh, but you have no idea what they've done or what sort of effect they've had. And so they could easily have shifted a baseline in the river, your sampling, or whatever they could have affected in the, in the environment. And then, of course, uh, wildlife are not stationary. So even if you're um, you know, on the park boundary of Banff, um, you know, the wildlife that are there, they can be off eating contaminated food. Um, there's all sorts of effects. They, they're not stationary. So even if your site is totally pristine, doesn't mean that the fish and wildlife are. Okay, this is a big challenge. So how long is long enough? How do you know when your data set is complete? And this is a, this, I, I might have mentioned this earlier. I know some people that have spent years and years and years doing PhDs and do this for a living. They go to conferences and discuss this. Uh, how do you know when you've actually measured your baseline? And I've said it's almost a philosophical question because Number one, no baseline is completely static. Everything in the environment is dynamic. So no matter how stable the flow in a river might be, there's de decadal oscillations and precipitation. Like there is no st such thing as a stable baseline. And so then the, the question is how long is long enough to understand that we've captured the variability? Probably if you're doing hydrology, you haven't monitored long enough to actually truly understand what a 1 in 100 year storm is. And even if you've measured one, you don't really know that that's a 1 in 100 year storm. So the question is always, have we collected enough to have confidence? And so I've put sort of the perspectives up top here. So stakeholders always want more, that's fair enough. Uh, if somebody is disturbing the environment in my backyard, I want to make sure that they've collected as much data as is humanly possible. The proponent wants to control cost, obviously. They don't want to just monitor everything every day for the rest of time. Government is looking for assurance of scientific validity. And again, that's why this is so challenging because there is really, I mean, there's statistical methods, but whether or not those actually tell you that the two or three or five years you've measured actually represents all of time or at least our our sort of time frame of interest, you'll, there's really no way of knowing. So what scientists must do is our due diligence. So due diligence means looking at literature. Is there some sort of a reference value that says for this type of uh, VEC, you must measure for this long? Is there a government regulation that says if uh, you're measuring, you must measure this long? If so, then you're good. Uh, you can use that and at least it's defensible. In a lot of different components, it, there is no truly defensible benchmark on, on how long this needs to be. So particularly if you're looking at uh, collecting baseline data to support a predictive assessment. So I've just talked about half of the problem, which is characterizing the environment. And now the other half is now we want to use a predictive tool. So if you're building the Goldson models, um, how many years of data do you need to put into that model? For that model to be robust enough to, to base predictions on. And again, there is no straightforward answer to this. However, there are some solutions. So typically, it's a fairly defensible uh, time period of one to three years, depending on the size of the project, depending on the environment, depending on whether or not uh, you have other data to supplement it, data from the government or data from another industry or whatever, master's project. Um, have you captured the seasons and sensitive periods of, of interest? If you've 
uh, gone out and measured fish while they're spawning for your straight, and everything seems to be fairly stable. You've got a decent, at least a defensible position that you can move forward to your EIA. But the big one is to uh, commit to continue monitoring during and post EIA. So every component, er, every proponent must monitor post EIA. It's going to be in every approval condition, but where they tend to fall down is they stop the monitoring. So they do a baseline. They say, okay, we've paid four million bucks. Go off and do the assessment. If we get the approval, we'll, we'll restart our monitoring. And so now you've got this gap, which is, which is problematic uh, scientifically because uh, you certainly don't know what happened in that period. You could have missed some major events, but it's, it's almost, yeah, I don't know, I'd say it's kind of like 50-50. Some, pro some proponents keep monitoring though they almost always scale it down uh, during that period. Some will just say, no, we're done. If we get approved, we'll restart monitoring. But the big thing is then uh, the risk to the uh, proponent is if they stop monitoring, you do your EIA, they start monitoring again, something's changed, now your EIA is thrown into question. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, but it does mean that you need to go back and do a lot of reanalysis to either confirm it or to update your conclusions, and that feeds into adaptive management. Okay, so budgeting. It's important. They can be huge. So analytical costs alone for a baseline program can often be over a million dollars. Helicopter fees, if you're going out to the middle of nowhere, that can be a million bucks. Uh, it's, it's really high stakes. And the reason it's high stakes is because the company that is paying for it usually is not yet generating profit. And so they're putting out all this money, uh, their manager is going to be all over them to keep their costs as low as possible uh, because um, you know it, everything is a loss at this point. Every, everything is a complete loss for them. Having specialized labor, which is always the case with the baseline, I don't know of any company on earth that has the kind of staff that could do their own baseline because you've got lots of specialized people and you only need them for this period when they're doing the baseline. So you can't really hire enough staff to do a baseline. Uh, so you pretty much always need to contract it out and you're bringing people in from far away depending on how specialized it is. I'll just briefly uh, recount a story from Mount Pauly. So uh, they, they had to do tadpole salvaging and the number of people in Canada that can salvage tadpoles uh, that are trained for that is very low. Uh, we had one in Vancouver and virtually everybody else came from either Eastern Canada, overseas. Basically, all these people had to sort of be brought in at the last minute and that gets really expensive uh, once you start getting into specialized labor. But this is why it's necessary. So. Uh, consider the cost of missing data, and that can depend on whether you're talking about before the approval or after the approval. So the most likely thing that will happen if not enough data are collected is the project will be sent back and the government will say this is incomplete, go back and monitor for a year and redo it and, and, and resubmit it. So that doesn't just cost the company the amount of the resampling, it costs a whole bunch of other things because now the whole process is ground to a halt. Baseline is essentially uh, a milestone that very little can be done if the baseline doesn't go ahead. So you can't do an EIA without a baseline, you can't get your approvals, you can't start the project. Everything sort of just stops and you go back in time. And now the company is not only spending the money they should have spent in the first place, but they're spending a whole lot more to make up for it. Um, so it puts the approval at risk. Even if the government accepts it, uh, you do your assessment and now people are reviewing your assessment in detail and they're pointing out, well, I don't really believe your prediction because you haven't measured anything during this period or you only measured for a year and that doesn't give me any confidence that you've measured a true baseline. And so both of those are kind of uh, tied together, low trust by stakeholders and approval at risk. Um, so. Again, it's not just going back and collecting the data, but say you missed out on fish data and you need to go back and collect fish data. Well, now you also have to collect the flows, the water chemistry, um, and other variables that will affect that because you need all of those uh, variables uh, collected at the same time. 
And a big risk is that you're now slowing down the process so much that the government says, well, actually your entire baseline is now obsolete. Uh, that was five years ago. Somebody else has opened a new project in the meantime. And so now just please start over. Now you're three years back. And I've seen that happen. It, it is not a good situation to be in for the company. So after the approval, if you haven't collected enough data, now this is where the risks actually get a lot higher. Uh, be before the approval, you're really just costing a lot of money and wasting time. But now, if you haven't got a proper baseline, uh, any sort of adverse effect that happens anywhere near the project will be immediately attributed to the project. And if the company or the scientist working for them doesn't have a good baseline data set, it's really difficult to say, yes, this was the project or no, it wasn't the project. And often what happens is then the proponent is forced to just mitigate the problem, pay to fix it, pay to avoid it, whatever it is, even if it's not their uh, impact. And then what I call the worst case scenario is you haven't collected enough uh, baseline data and now you've made, a big, you've made a big mistake in your EIA and you didn't predict something that actually did happen, so an, an adverse impact occurred that you totally missed because you hadn't characterize the baseline well enough, now the company is doing reactive mitigation. And reactive mitigation is an order of magnitude or more, always more expensive than actually just avoiding the problem in the first place. Anytime you have to clean something up, I know some people here are interested in working with contaminated sites, and that is always the issue there. If you measure uh, hydrocarbons in, in groundwater downstream of a gas station, um, they could have put in a better barrier in the beginning and maybe paid a million dollars. They didn't. It leaked into the groundwater and now it's a hundred million dollar cleanup. Um, it's, it's always the case that the reactive mitigation is going to be way, way, way more expensive. And ultimately projects die because of this and they go bankrupt and leaving a giant mess. And that's how we get legacy sites. And essentially, if you've heard of Superfund sites in the USA, that's, that's what causes a Superfund site. So a Superfund site is a mess that's so big that no company can pay for it. The company goes bankrupt. It's now the federal government's problem. And that is why. Okay, so integrating TEK. We talked a bit about this last time, so I won't repeat it all. But I did, I did sort of maybe add a little bit of guidance here. So Usually your VECs are what uh, uh, the people who contribute to TEK know the most about, but it's the components that uh, support the analysis of the, of the VECs, so the air quality, water quality. These are usually not VECs on their own, but they help uh, assess significance of the VECs. So I, I kind of think of it that way. Um, now, even though myself, I... Uh, do water quality assessments, and I rarely get TEK that is directly comparable to my data. I can use it to actually form a hypothesis and say, well, people have noticed some change over in this region. Maybe we can go and study upstream of that and see if we can detect what's causing it. Um, so it can really guide your monitoring. It can guide your assessment in terms of uh, your receptors. Uh, but it is, it is always challenging. And my last topic before I get into the case study are legacy projects. So usually a project, if it's developed before 1990, you'll find no baseline. The odd one, you will, but they're very rare. And even throughout the 90s, there are some projects that don't have a baseline or just have a completely uh, in, uh, insufficient baseline. And so now another project comes along, either right next door, right downstream, downwind, whatever it is. That's basically this situation here, except that we have absolutely no idea what this is. We have no clue whatsoever. We just know that it was much lower, probably more pristine, whatever we're measuring. We know that we're measuring something that's affected. And there are some really good examples of that uh, locally. Uh, the Okanagan is very high in, uh, the, the groundwater in the Okanagan is very high in arsenic, uranium, and molybdenum. There was actually a uh, uranium mine started um, at, uh, at Hydraulic Lake, which is just up Highway 33, and it was abandoned. Uh, we, so we do have this mineralogy, which 
uh, leads to very high concentrations in the groundwater. And of course, when uh, a mine has been operating for 100 years, which is the case for Nickel Plate Mine, Beaverdale Mine, there's, there's a bunch of mines that are out there that have really high concentrations of arsenic in the groundwater, molybdenum, and some of them have uranium. And now the question is, did the mine cause this high groundwater? And if you look at the region, you would probably say, no, it's not really much higher than the entire region. Uh, but if it's any bit higher whatsoever, uh, you, you can't say it's no effect. And you don't really know specifically what it was at that location. So it's almost impossible to understand which part of uh, this perceived effect is actually a real effect. And that's a huge stakeholder issue, uh, particularly something like arsenic, where people hear the word arsenic and they really don't care that arsenic is naturally high. They don't care that uh, maybe it's actually even below guidelines. They just see that arsenic is higher than usual and people freak out. So that's a huge problem. And it's a huge problem with virtually any, any legacy project. The, the issues are different, but like the specific issues are different, but the overall issue of having a baseline for a legacy project is pretty universal. This is another one. This is a major issue. So this is, uh, this is the Athabasca River, and this is called the McMurray Formation. This is where all the bitumen is located. And there are lots of rivers like this around that region where the river uh, cuts into the banks and it erodes the bitumen. The bitumen is now in the water. Somebody measures it downstream. And of course, I blame industry. And so there's this very long running debate about how much is natural, how much is uh, anthropogenic. Paleolimnological studies are really, really good for filling in uh, a missing baseline. So a paleolimnological study is there's a lake usually or a river, and this is sediment. And you put uh, a coring device in, you pull the sediment up, and you'll see all the layers, which correspond usually to an annual or some other period of deposition. Particularly in rivers, they're pretty predictable because you can tell when the floods were. And you pull out this tiny little bit of sediment, and you can measure isotopes, you can measure uh, which diatom was present at that time or which diatom was dominant. You can measure how much pollen or which type of pollen was there, which tells you what tree species was around there, which tells you a little bit about the climate. Um, measure, um, all, well, the list, the list is pretty much endless, but anything that's preserved, that uh, anything that doesn't degrade uh, completely over time, uh, which most things don't degrade because these are anaerobic, uh, let's us kind of back calculate out what the water looked like at that time. So metals, metals are nice, they are pretty stable. Um, but so in this case, it was uh, researchers from Wilfrid Laurier University and they did multiple core samples. They also aligned it with uh, traditional ecological knowledge going back to which years the floods occurred, uh, going back about a century, they, went, they aligned it with um, tree rings going back hundreds of years and then isotopes to kind of do the rest. And they kind of teased out their proportions of what they, what they calculated to be natural versus, versus anthropogenic. So that brings us to our case study. So the case study is the Peace Athabasca Delta. Uh, it's a really beautiful place. So most of it is within uh, Wood Buffalo National Park. So this is the Northwest Territories, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. Uh, Athabasca River flows north, and the Peace flows uh, from the west. And they form the Slave River, which flows into Great Slave Lake. And so that's the terminology, Peace, Athabasca Delta. All of this area is essentially a delta formed by these rivers uh, before they flow into uh, the Slave River. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so the UN actually uh, sends people up here to check on it. They don't actually do the monitoring, but they audit the monitoring that, that the Government of Canada is doing. It's a very significant area for First Nations. Um, there are several First Nations 
most of whom live in Fort Chip, but a lot of whom sort of live out on the land. Uh, lots in Fort Smith, there's a few uh, nations along the way. Um, so all of, them, all of them sort of consider Peace Athabasca Delta to be the most uh, sacred place on Earth. It also has a lot of uh, rare and protected species, which I'll show some photos of. So here's the issue. Unfortunately, we had development of oil sands mines and the WAC Bennett Dam in 1967. Um, PC Hydro did a, actually did a couple of years of monitoring of flows before that. Unfortunately for them, it was very high years of flow. And so their baseline is actually, in terms of flow, much higher than the rest of the monitoring record. But essentially, we've got this confluence. Uh, Athabasca River comes out here. This is all a major delta, all the sediments that are put into the Athabasca River, which goes all the way to Jasper. There's the Athabasca Glacier. It flows all the way through um, a couple hundred kilometers of farmland. It's highly erodible sediment. It's all prairie till. And so even way upstream of Fort McMurray, um, even at White Court, um, if you know where that is, the Athabasca River is pretty muddy. And it's just regular old prairie till that fills up the river with, with sediment. And it all drops out here, because this is essentially flat. And uh, the Athabasca River flows into Lake Athabasca in all of these braided channels. And here's the Peace River. Um, it's about 10 times larger than the Athabasca, I think. It's, it's really huge though. The Peace River is really huge by this point. And what happens is um, the, the, the Peace River uh, forms a really thick layer of ice and every um, whatever the period is, 10, 50, 100 years, depending on the climate cycles, there will be a major ice jam on the Slave River. And when there's an ice jam on the Slave River, the Peace River backs up, and this river, uh, which is actually called the Riviere de Roche, this flows backwards, and the water, the water from the Peace River actually flows backwards up this river, and it goes into Lake Athabasca, but more importantly, it floods this entire region. So you've got all of these uh, little tiny perched basins, which are higher than the water table, so they you know, will very, very, very slowly lose water over time, and it's only when this ice jam occurs and the water backs up and it flows backwards and it floods this landscape that all of these little uh, pools are replenished. So the, hy the hydrologic regime of the Peace River, as you'll definitely read about if you're, looking, if you're doing anything to do with water on, on your project, is uh, supremely important for this habitat. And so here's just kind of a couple of snapshots. It's really beautiful, it's really unique. There aren't a lot of places like this on Earth. Uh, well, there are zero other places like this on Earth, actually, which is why it's a World Heritage Site. Um, so you have a lot of unique habitats, and it's very sensitive because if it doesn't get these ice jams reflooding, um, essentially the place is gonna dry up and uh, it'll shift from an aquatic ecosystem into a terrestrial ecosystem which of course has implications for everything that lives there. So there's some bison. Um, I'm not sure how many places are left on earth where you can see wild bison. Uh, there's Elk Island Park outside of Edmonton. There's Yellowstone. I don't know of any others, but uh, it's definitely one of the key features of this area is it's one of the last um, uh, free roaming herds on earth. And for example, Elk Island, the place, I mean, it's a national park, but it's completely fenced. It's a really weird park, and it's tiny. So, I mean, there isn't really any place else like this on Earth, uh, particularly for wild, um, um, I can't remember what the term is, but basically they, ha they still have all their wild genetics, which is um, every other bison, they're either farmed or they've been moved and they're isolated and the gene pool is, is very restricted. Here's the largest beaver dam on Earth. It's, uh, I can't remember, it, it's over a kilometer long though. There's all sorts of stuff like this in the park. It's just really amazing. Whooping cranes. Um, all the whooping cranes uh, fly up over the oil sands uh, area and land in the Peace Athabasca Delta. Um, now this hasn't happened with whooping cranes, fortunately, but a big problem with any sort of mine or any sort of industrial process, there's a lot of different industries that have this, 
Uh, cooling ponds, for example, they have these large open water areas and the open water areas are either receiving some heat from uh, materials or a blowdown, say, from, a, from any kind of power plant. And so you have this open water area and the rest of the land is completely uh, frozen because it's northern Canada. And so for four or five months a year, there is no open water except for um, these industrial ponds. And so any bird that flies over it is attracted to it and will land on it. And so if you've got something toxic in your pond, you've got a nightmare of a wildlife problem because you have to deter the wildlife from landing there. But what happened, for example, at Syncrude five or 10 years ago, um, they have these cannons that blow off to make noise um, and they're really loud. There was a bad storm uh, which caused a number of things. Number one, the power went out, the air cannons went out and I don't know exactly what the dynamics were with the birds, but for some reason this storm caused them to really need a place to land. So they landed on the tailings pond and died. It's a big issue. Fortunately, uh, no whooping cranes have landed there yet, but these are just some of the issues facing the peace at the Basque Delta. There, there's lots of big issues and it's one of the last really natural areas, so it's, it's got a high level of, of protection applied to it. This is just a little conceptual schematic. Um, I kind of skimmed over a couple parts of that. So the ice jams will happen here, but they're not very frequent and they don't do as much as the piece. But this ice jam up here is what really back floods all of these little perch basins. So under normal conditions, the, the Birch River comes in and flows through here, but the Birch River doesn't flood the landscape. It, it floods Lake Clare and then it floods a few channels but in terms of all of this landscape, it needs the ice jams in order to uh, replenish all of the water across the delta. Well, not all of it, but most of it. Uh, these, are, these are some figures from Environment Canada's submission to the Site C uh, EIA process, and it's just kind of showing the mechanism. So the ice jams, um, some flow goes underneath, but as soon as, uh, as, soon as you start to constrict that flow, uh, the water is going to spill the banks. And so this is what I mentioned about Lake Athabasca. Normal conditions, water is flowing towards the Peace River. You put an ice jam here. Uh, you put an ice jam, ice jam downstream on the Slave River, and now the water flows backwards. So there's all sorts of really cool and unique things about this environment. Uh, another one. Uh, this is just kind of showing what I've already talked about. Um, yeah, so there are lake expansion floods when the water comes up in the lake, but again, it, it's very limited. It will only uh, flood a certain distance away from the lake, and the ice jams are what really uh, supports the perch basins that are higher up. And when we're talking about higher up, we're not talking about mountains, we're talking about just m a few meters, because this landscape is a delta, it's very flat. So. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many projects were developed uh, upstream of the uh, Peace Athabasca Delta. Um, there are at least five pulp mills on uh, the Athabasca River. There's pulp mills all over the Peace River system, both in Alberta and BC. There's oil sands, uh, there's agriculture, there's both anthropogenic and natural climate change going on urban development, their cities, all of these are contributing to um, changes in the Peace Athabasca Delta. Uh, we have traditional harvesting, which is now aided by power boats and guns and all sorts of things that weren't there back um, when the, uh, the, the Peace Athabasca Delta had sort of its baseline over thousands of years. Uh, throw some beavers into the mix, um, hydroelectric there's at least three hydroelectric dams now, and there's probably going to be one or two more. So it's a real issue and a uh, big problem for trying to do a, a proper EIA and understand what the effects really are. Okay, so I talked about paleo, paleolinology. Um, so these are the different types of lines of evidence. You can use models, but of course models have all sorts of issues, particularly going back projecting back in time when you don't have the proper baseline to start with. If a model doesn't have a proper baseline, 
it's not that useful of a model. Um, TEK has been used, um, but again, that's better for some components than others. Control site is great if there is a control site. There is no control site for the piece at the basket delta. Uh, there's no other piece at the basket delta you can go measure and say, has this changed in the same way? Uh, tree rings are really interesting. In addition to just looking at the tree rings, there's actually fossil records of trees that were damaged by ice jams. And so I think, I think it was researchers at the University of Calgary who have gone and reconstructed these long, long, long records of um, ice jam uh, occurrences based on how the trees have, sorry, how the trees have been impacted by major ice jams and then they become fossilized and now you can go back and reconstruct it. And then they also go all the way back to explorer records to see did they know any sort of high or low water 